Hi, welcome to the series of three videos about how to help Tinkercad students get started with Fusion 360. My name is Guillermo Milantoni. I'm a senior product manager at Autodesk. I'm also the lead for Tinkercad and part of the product management team for Fusion 360. That gives me a very unique experience and perspective on both products. I'm also a former teacher. I used to teach design and architectural design um, at university and definitely passionate about education and how to inspire the next generations of creative minds to get into design thinking and problem solving in a very creative way. What we'll cover today is uh, addressing the question that many teachers ask, which is, okay, how can we help students who are ready for advanced redesign software beyond Tinkercad, right? So they're using Tinkercad and they're starting to feel that that they can do more, than they, that what they have is not enough. And how do we help them to make that next step? That's a very important next step. So in this video, I'll cover why you'd want to try Fusion 360. Also, who is eligible for using Fusion 360, ways in you can tell students are ready for that, and the steps to follow to transition from Tinkercad to Fusion 360. It is definitely very important to get the timing right when introducing a new tool. I mean, it's just like when knowing how to go from a bike with training wheels to a bike without training wheels, right? If you're doing the wrong timing, the kid will fall. It's an amazing journey, and we just need to make sure that what we provide is a proper pathway for that experience, since the learning curve can also be leading to frustration if not done properly. And uh, students often start with Tinkercad in early elementary school, sometimes even in kindergarten with very basic exercises, very, with a lot of help from the teachers, and tend to use it into the middle school years, sometimes in, into high school, and definitely some people into college. It's during this time, middle school, end of middle school, into high school, when they start asking, what's next? What, can I, what else can I do? And uh, we have a very well, good solution to help all kids get started, including those who want to follow a path in design or engineering or architecture. We're also clear on the fact that adding too much power on Tinkercad does not make sense given that this power is already available on other products like Fusion 360, Revit, and the rest of Autodesk portfolio. The, the thing we don't want is just to remove the simplicity of Tinkercad just to add more features that are available on other places that they can go to, right? So just we want to ensure that Tinkercad stays simple and there's a lot of power in that simplicity and then they just take the right steps into the next level when appropriate. So let's talk about the starting point. When kids try Tinkercad, they have already developed an aggregation mindset. They often have experience assembling wooden blocks, playing with Minecraft, or putting bricks or logs together. Think of Tinkercad as a digital counterpart. You can use all these basic shapes that we provide and create something new by putting them together. For example, if I asked you how you would build this chair, there's a high chance that you will say, hmm, okay, the way I would do it is maybe start with a structure for the seat, the legs, etc. Maybe this is an option, maybe this is another option. But a kid would mostly visualize this as a set of blocks. Products like Minecraft have become so popular because you just build based on adding and removing blocks. We often start our learning based on what's already familiar to us. Start with nothing is terrifying at all ages. When editing shapes in Tinkercad, our controls look like the ones you use to edit shapes in slideshows or photo editing software. Our mental model makes a lot of sense for anyone that has worked with any of these apps and played with construction games, either digitally or in the physical world. The keyword here is familiarity. Now, when you wanna go to the next step, it's very important to understand also the difference, the impressive difference in, in, in the abstraction, in the capacity of abstraction in terms of going from 2D to 3D. When you try to go from 2D to 3D by sketching and not by aggregation, there's a lot of abstraction. So if I draw something like this very simple sketch, depending on the technique you use for modeling, that sketch can become any of these shapes. It could be an extrusion, a sweep, a loft, and it's a lot to absorb, it's a lot to understand. That mindset takes a while, high school or even college level for some people, until students really understand and embrace it properly. The transformation from sketching to 3D is not simple or obvious, and we don't have to take it for granted. It's also very important to create a product design mindset. We start with simple objects, which can be used together to create more complex objects. That's the basic of Tinkercad, right? You drag and drop primitives of all the basic shapes that we have in the product. Now, the next step would involve a little more, right? So just how do you put them together? So 
Let's talk about the, that, that red, the flange tube there, right? So at first the red object looks like a flat box with two wedges and a cylinder with a hole. That's how you build it, right? Just one rectangle or a box, two cylinders, one of them is a hole and two wedges. Very simple. But it's not a very well-known object that you might want to use many other times for other projects. So how you do that? Instead of just copying that and putting it again on another project, right? So we made a library which is the shape library in which you can publish your own things into your shape panel and even right now be able to share with other people. So we have this library from which you can reuse your shapes and turn them into this library, which is going to be very, very helpful for working. And because you know what? That concept is the same that you would use in the mechanical world on architecture and anything, right? Which is the idea of working with libraries, like in this case, the Mac Mastercard library. And if you just look around you, anything you see was designed based on parts that already exist, new elements, and from also pieces in catalogs. Building based on libraries is an important skill we introduce in Tinkercad. So again, when you see kids that are already sort of trying to understand how to create these objects and reuse them, that's, that's a great hint also about how prepared they are to move into a next step. And here are a few examples of projects that use basic concepts on, on, on Tinkercad. The first one is a name tag, and a name tag is, is a fantastic first project. Sometimes we just think, oh, okay, it's so simple, it's so easy. Yeah, it is, but it's great. And that's, that's that ease of, of making it is, is part of that, right? So it's a, it's a flat object, mostly, that is very easy to build. Just a box with a cylinder, with a hole and a name, and, and then sometimes some old decoration, but basically that's it. It builds very easily, it prints very easily. There, there are very slim chances of, of a printer failing on something so simple. And um, it's portable. It's personal, right? Relatable because it has your name. So printing a name tag is fast, it's satisfying, and, uh, and, and kids love that, right? So that is the name tag, as simple as it looks, as a first example, is, is just everything that's good on the design, the name tag is that. Now, of course, you cannot make name tags forever, right? So you need to keep moving. And, and sometimes that could be just enhanced the designs by adding electronics, lights, sounds. Um, you can start a design like this in Tinkercad and then refine it eventually in Fusion 360, like in the case of the line following robots, in which the basic concept was was thought on Tinkercad and then it was extended into Vision 360 for creating the PCB board and some other mechanisms. Uh, and, and projects like this are a good place to start building skills slowly but steadily. And they're very helpful if you decide to move to more advanced software like again Fusion 360, Revit, Maya or the rest of the Autodesk portfolio. Tinkercad is also an ecosystem and also part of a larger ecosystem. Maybe you're very focused on just one part of that ecosystem, and that's okay. Uh, when you put everything together, it's mind-blowing, because all of a sudden your plastic shape you made in the 3D environment, added with some lights and sensors, along with some coding, could be Arduino, could be Microbit, becomes this amazing new design. That intersection of all these three things is, is so, so satisfying, so great. It, it, it just triggers all the what-ifs of things that you can do. And again, if you use just one of the, of the, of the environments, that's okay too. Maybe you're just missing on, on, on the whole thing, but we don't want to make it scary either. Things get very, very much more interesting when students decide to take that step further. And uh, if you think about the next step into Fusion 360, on Tinkercad we're talking about 3D design and making, electronics design and simulation, 3D design via visual programming. When you move into Fusion 360, we're talking about, again, 3D design and fabrication, more more manufacturing mechanisms and, and, te and techniques, definitely, electronics design and mechatronics, and 3D parametric and also generative design, which, which is, again, a very, very obvious next step for those people that are interested in, in, the, in, in moving into the design, mechanical design or industrial design world. So it's, again, what you design here is not very different in some of the mechanisms, but then you just get adding some so much more power for what Fusion 360 offers. And we want to encourage young people to start using Coldblast for designing with visual programming, sketching with a scribble tool, or designing everyday objects by direct manipulation. All of this that you can see here has been done in Tinkercad, and you see a lot of kids that are very, very satisfied and very happy with the results. Again, 
as they move forward, they will become the professionals of tomorrow, right? So, and we want to give them a clear path to becoming whatever they want to be, right? Some of these kids end up following a career in engineering, they have a very strong start. And the rest of the kids, you know what? They still have a great advantage. They developed a mindset where iteration and failure is part of a process. Design thinking is just not for designers. So how do you tell when, when somebody's ready for, for a next step? You'll, you'll start hearing some questions or some comments, sometimes even some complaints, right? Um, like, how can I split an edge? Or how can I bevel or meter an edge? Or just sometimes they will say, how can I cut a little bit of the edge? Or they want to hollow a model with the same thickness. Um, they want more control of what they're doing. They want to build bigger option, objects. Um, they want to make things look better or they need more resolution. So, so many different questions um, that it's important to understand sort of that, that step on their, on their, on their life, in the, on their life cycle, on the design applications. And, uh, and again, by design, we don't add a lot of complexity to Tinkercad because we don't think that is the answer. We really want to keep it as a very, very extremely low learning curve so you can get there as fast as possible, have immediate satisfaction by understanding how to build, not even almost like learning the software, because again, based on familiarity, the software is already, it's almost, almost all the mechanisms are there for things that you've done in the past. And again, the simplicity of Tinkercad is one of the reasons of the success. I want to look at an example. So not long ago, we added a microbit simulator to the Tinkercad Circus work, workspace. If you may have seen it, and if not, please go ahead and, and take a look at it because it's amazing. So in this case, we designed a very simple game on microbit, which involves holding the board and tilting it. So a rock is going to be coming down, and you just have to move a character, which is just a little, a little light on, at the bottom, and by tilting the microbit, you you get it to move left or right. Now. Instead of just holding the microbit, I want to design a little controller that looks like the ones I might already have at home on a gaming console. So what can I do if I take this design a little further beyond Tinkercad? So because in this case, again, we build this in Tinkercad and those edges might hurt. Uh, they may not be very comfortable. I might want to see if will this thing break or how can I print it with more resolution because we have curves and again, sometimes you need more resolution to make that curve look, smooth, uh, look smoother. I want to tell a story about it. Maybe I want to document it better. All of those things will lead into, I just need a little more. So as you can see here, uh, the model, I create a model in Tinkercad and, and the whole part in red is very simple. It's just a, a box with, uh, with some subtraction of a little box on the top. Um, also some space for the two buttons of the microbit and that snaps into, into, the, in, into the box. Two half cylinders for, for gripping, for, for grabbing the control. And, uh, and then on the bottom, uh, two holes that go all across so we can actually use uh, popsicle sticks, uh, which we have a whole library about that. And then of course you can buy some, some treats and, uh, and use the popsicle sticks to, to build your, your controller on, on Tinkercad. So I now want to take the design a little further. I decide to send it to Fusion 360 to make the edges smoother so it's more comfortable to hold. In Tinkercad, under the Send to button, we have the option to send to Fusion 360. For that to work, you need to have Fusion 360 installed in your computer. And if you don't have it, just don't worry. There's an instruction there to see how to un download it and install it. Um, in order to have Fusion 360 account, students need to be 13 years of older. Also, in some countries, the minimum age has moved uh, to 14 years old, and it may also change in some other places. So you just check, depending where you are. In the US right now, it's 13 years of older. Most of the world is 13 years. South Korea and China right now are the ones that moved it up to 14 years of old or older. And one thing to note here, this is not an export. It's under the send to not the export. When you export, you normally take geometry into somewhere else. And uh, if we took geometry from Tinkercad, we would take it as geometry, which is a mesh, which is not very useful for mechanical CAD. In this case, sent to Fusion, what it does, it, it captures the recipe of how we built in Tinkercad, and it takes that recipe to a service that then recreates that on native Fusion 360 format. So it's native Tinkercad to native Fusion 360. 
By the way, by this time, this function works only with basic shapes, which I would say most of the things you build are basic shapes anyway. If you have other things, you can definitely export those little parts into Fusion separately if you need them. But for basic shapes, this is almost like magic because you go from native Tinkercad to native Fusion 360. So again, at, once you click on Send to Fusion, after a couple of seconds, Fusion will open with that same model. It looks just like the other one. And now we are ready to get started, which we'll see how what to do on the next uh, video. So as a little summary, we, we were looking into why would we try Fusion 360, at which point it makes sense to try Fusion 360, and how can I understand how the readiness of my of my students? And then also, for, of course, what steps can we follow from Tinker to Fusion 360? In the next videos, we will examine more closely how to work on Fusion 360 once you took everything from Tinkercad. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in video two.